All right, thank you, Venkat. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about large scale low latency storage or how we serve the graph at Facebook. So I'm actually gonna give a brief overview of some of the different real time systems we have at Facebook to kind of show why we pick certain solutions for different problems. And then I'll talk a bit about our graph data, the problems we have with it, why it's difficult, uh, the considerations around uh, our solution. And then I'll finally go into details about how we actually serve the graph at Facebook. So the first thing we have is real-time data. So we have a lot of different data systems at Facebook, uh, real-time analytics, uh, all sorts of different things. I'm gonna be talking mostly about real-time data today. So this is a picture of Facebook. Who here has used Facebook before? <laughs> Good, most of you. So I don't have to explain exactly what Facebook is. So this picture of Facebook is actually different than what you see. Why? Because Facebook is completely different for every person. All this data is completely dynamically generated from all of our various data systems. So the first one we have, the first system I'm going to briefly talk about is messages. So you can see here I've pulled out some different places where messages exist on Facebook, but messages is also used for mobile, for mobile to mobile messaging, all those different types of systems. So what are the considerations of the messages system that we built? The first, it's a large historical data set. So we have lots and lots and lots of message history for users that go back a long time. However, most of that data is not accessed. The most common data, of course, is the most recent data being sent. So when you send a new message, you look at your new message, uh, and so the recent data is the very hot data. Very write heavy. So again, lots and lots of writes compared to the reads. It's also private data meaning the data is uh, only accessed by that single given user. So you have a mailbox, every person has that assigned to them, and only that user is accessing that data. So this is different than our graph data we'll talk about, which is uh, a, a much more widely spread and read data. So the solution we've come up with is actually using HBase plus caches. So at the top we have our mobile, www, whatever it may be. We have these concepts of cells, which are basically chunks of users assigned to a different setup. We have what we call Titan, which is both an app server and a cache server. This cache, again, is designed to be all the recent real-time uh, messaging uh, data. And then it persists down to HBase. So why did we pick HBase for this? The reason we picked HBase is because it's very, very write intensive. Again, the caches in Titan can handle most of the reads because, again, it's recent data. HBase works very, very well for very write intensive append type workloads. So the next system I want to talk about is actually Timeline. So Timeline, we can see from my original picture with the various links to it, so whenever you click on someone's name, you go to their Timeline. The Timeline looks something like this. So we have all these beautiful pictures and stuff, but what we have is the actual data uh, in the Timeline. So we have the activity log, we have the actual news feed here, the, the Timeline feed, and of course we have the scrubber where we can go back in time. So what are the considerations for the Timeline system? The timeline system also gets a lot of writes. It also is very siloed. So when you're reading data, you're normally reading data just for a single user. You know, you click on their timeline, you see data just for that given user. Again, we have lots of reads of recent data, so the most common stories are very commonly read. However, there's also many large range reads of older data. So this is a much bigger difference compared to our, our messages system because we're actually doing reads of all this data. So when someone clicks on you know, 2011, my, we have to go and get that data. We collect all that data from, in this case, MySQL. The aggregator reads in all the possible stories, figures out the best ones for the user, which then gets displayed back on the page. Now this calculation is very expensive, so we actually store these cached uh, values, you know, what are your best 2011 stories, into memcache, so that way subsequent lookups and people viewing your page can see that. So the reason we have this external cache is again because lots of people are viewing this single user data. So that gets us to the next system, the big system, graph data. So graph data is almost everything else that you see on Facebook. So we have things such as uh, you know, events, uh, friends requests, all the comments on these photos. The photos themselves are served, of course, through our media systems, uh, but the comments on the photos, the fact people have liked things, uh, how many friends you have, all of these sorts of things are all served from our graph data. So thinking about graph data in a little more abstract way, we have something like this. So in our graph system, we have what we call objects and associations. We actually use the same name that Dropbox does for them. Pretty interesting. 
So what we have here is we have um, edges. So in this case, we have, for example, user, user, and then we have a friends link between them. These associations can be either single direction or bi-directional. So for example, the friendship is a bi-directional, but something like page putting a post up is a single direction type association. So other considerations. So our graph data has to have very, very fast response time. We're fetching a lot of this data, and it's always pretty much user-facing, so we need to have very, very fast access for this. So under one millisecond is our average, and we are trying to always make that faster. Near 100% correct. So when I say we need the data to be correct, that seems kind of like a weird statement. However, certain systems don't need exactly correct data. Like take, for example, search. If two people see slightly different search res results, that's not really a bad thing. It's, it's, that's totally OK within the constraints of the system. However, if you and your friend are seeing completely different you know, comments on a photo, that's really bad. So we want to avoid those types of situations uh, where we're not showing this correct data. We have extremely, extremely heavy read to write ratio. So 99.99% .99 reads plus to this data. You know, someone uploads a photo, that photo gets viewed by all their friends, and then it also gets viewed by uh, you know, people commenting on it, and all these types of things. So lots and lots and lots of reads going on in the system. So other challenges. It's a highly interconnected data set. So we can't easily partition our data. So one thing people always discuss is, OK, can we break you know, Facebook Europe users away from Facebook US versus you know, Asia, all these things? Unfortunately, we really can't. The graph itself is very, very interconnected. So people are not only friends across them, but within our graph, we have things like pages. Like you know, Justin Bieber is popular all over the world, um, unfortunately. But that's um, <laughs> the way that works. So we also have a very, very, very large data set. Many, many, many petabytes uh, of graph data. And also we have a very large working set for this. So when I talk about the working set is a lot of the graph data doesn't ever get old. So things like friends. It doesn't matter whether you became friends three years ago or recent. There's no sort of temporal nature to the data. We still need to access that data over and over and over. And finally, moving fast. So that's one of our tenants here at Facebook is we want our engineers to be able to develop awesome products very, very quickly. So because of that, we have to do lots of things to make sure our graph is very dynamic in what can be stored there and how they can change things. So in conclusion, applications are increasingly data-driven. Uh, we choose and design different systems for different needs. We don't pick a technology and say, hey, what can we use this for? Instead, we get a problem and figure out what is the best technology to use for that, whether that be MySQL, HBase, or other ways. So we have to clearly identify our goals, and then we build towards those. So now let's talk about how we actually serve our graph. So what stack did we actually come up with in order to, uh, to serve our graph in real time? So the first thing I'm going to start with is MySQL. So MySQL is our persistent storage. So this is a source of truth where data actually gets written out uh, to permanent storage. So in our case, we have different regions. In this case, these regions are actually different geographical regions in the world. So Facebook has data centers in Oregon, Carolina, Sweden, a new one coming up in Iowa. And we have these copies of the data all around the world going on here. So we actually use MySQL asynchronous replication to keep these in sync. So we have a master region. The master region can actually move around. It isn't actually set. But the master region is here. The right comes in, asynchronously replicated across there. We spend a lot of time looking and monitoring, uh, fixing minus core replication lag to make sure that it's really good. Generally, we always have a P95 of under one second. In order, so basically, our data is being distributed worldwide in under one second. So now, why do we use MySQL? There's all these other uh, databases out there, whether it be Mongo, Postgres, and so on. Why do we use MySQL? Well, we're actually always testing new technologies. We test it against HBase. We test it against other things, trying to decide what the best one is. So there's a couple of things. The first thing is it's very, very efficient for IOPS when we're dealing with disk. So when you're on a disk-based system, MySQL has lots of awesome uh, tricks in NODB, whether it be uh, change buffering and other sorts of things to make it very efficient for the actual storage of data. Now, when we get to things like Flash, things like compression, so uh, MySQL NODB has built-in compression, which we use heavily, which reduces our data size uh, uh, quite dramatically in order to reduce the number of servers we need uh, quite a bit. So compression is a super important thing, which is relatively unique in these open source options. 
We do use a lot of features in MySQL, things like transactions. So we have multiple mutations that we want to do as part of a single transaction, things like secondary indexes, being able to do things like that. Range scans are very important for us. Also the fact that we can have alternate access patterns. So when we do migrations and things like that, we need to be able to access data through full table scans and other sorts of methods, not just you know, key value or single small range lookups. Being able to do all this custom thing works very well. So now on top of that, we built something called Tau. So we actually published a paper about Tau, describing kind of what it is. Has anyone here seen the Tau paper before? Anyone? A lot of you, actually. That's pretty good. So it's a pretty cool system. So this is basically our distributed graph storage system built on top of MySQL. So most access to MySQL actually goes directly through this Tau system. So it's a write-through, read-through system. So the, again, the PHP or whatever doesn't write directly to the database. Instead, it talks to Tau, which then actually does it. It understands nodes and edges and uh, can enforce more complex graph logic. So things like, OK, this is a bidirectional association. So when you say, I want to add one edge, it automatically adds the additional edge for you. And finally, easy to define objects and associations. This goes back to the moving fast I talked about. We want to have developers able to completely uh, define things themselves. So if someone says, hey, I want to store some new data, they can very easily define a new object, start using it right away. There's no admins. There's nothing involved in order for them to do that. So they can very easily start storing new data uh, into the Tau system. So how does Tau work? So zooming in on one region, it looks something like this. So the first thing we have is up top is we have these front-end clusters. So these are just basically big chunks of our web serving capability uh, in, in each region. We have, normally have lots of these within a region. And then we have our back-end cluster. So our back-end cluster is where the databases are. Uh, there can be more than one, but we can think of it kind of as a single entity here. So what we have is that we then have Tau with these Tau followers and these Tau leaders. These basically work like an L1, L2 type cache. So in this case, the uh, web needs some piece of data. It will then send the request to the Tau follower. If the follower has the data, it can return it. If not, it forwards that request down to the Tau leader. The Tau leader then can th then say, OK, I have the data, return it. If not, go down to MySQL to the permanent store, and then, of course, return it back up the stack. So why do we have this? Well, a couple of reasons. First, the Tau followers, we actually have redundant copies of the data effectively. We have one set of these followers per region or per uh, front end cluster. So this can serve the very, very hottest data on Facebook. So again, you, know, you go back to the Justin Bieber post, you know, getting many, many interactions, millions of people seeing this basically in real time. We can have multiple machines, followers, actually all serving the same exact data. So that way we can scale out as we add new web clusters, we can add these new followers along the way. So we can linearly scale basically our reads to make sure we can handle the load of the Justin Biebers of the world. The leaders only have a single copy per region. So it, this is a much less frequently accessed data, but it can still help reduce the load on the database and prevent things like thundering herds and all sorts of other uh, good things as well. So that's the read path. So now let's look at the write path. So the write path of Tau looks something like this. So again, same exact flow. You know, you write to the follower. The follower then forwards it on to the leader, which forwards it to MySQL in order to do the actual write. So again, this is a write through uh, path. So this single region, pretty simple. But let's go to the more complex view, which is when we're doing remote regions. So let's say someone you know, in a remote region, so uh, uh, Oregon wants to write data. And our, say our master is in Carolina. So we want to write data. How does that work? So what we have is we have the web, again, send the request to the Tau follower. It then forwards it to the Tau leader. This Tau leader then says, hey, I'm not in charge of writing to the database. So it forwards that across to the master region, which then writes to the local database. And then finally, of course, the asynchronous MySQL replication brings it back to there. So this seems kind of convoluted. How do, uh, what are the advantages we get out of this? So there's several advantages. The first thing is we can do multiple requests essentially in a single RPC here. So a lot of our requests want to do like add three associations, two objects, or something like that. We can bundle those all up, do those in a single round trip essentially across the region. So even though we have this latency across uh, country or wherever, we can basically hide that latency because we're only doing it once. The second thing is it leads to our cache consistency model. Because we're doing a write-through model, where basically we have the web write to the followers and so on, 
the web in our front end cluster is actually able to read that data immediately. So you get this read after write type consistency to ensure that people uh, can see the data that they just uploaded. So if someone uploads a photo, they can see it immediately even before it reaches their local database. So this is the tau consistency model that we've come up with that works for our graph data. So as I said, read after write. This works because of two reasons. One, tau is a write through cache, so we're able to write through the data that you can then read immediately. And then two, because users generally are sticky to this front end cluster. So since a user is, is accessing the same tau uh, follower repeatedly, that one has its data and is able to see it. Keep in mind other people in different front end clusters in that region, so your friend, may not immediately see that data. Instead, it waits for it to have to replicate across via the replication stream. Um, the big thing there, though, is they're always progressing forward. So that's the second part of our consistency model, is things are always increasing. So like the number of likes are always going up on things, so people can see a consistent model. If people see things like the likes increasing and decreasing depending on where they're hitting and so on, that leads to a very poor user experience, uh, which is not desired. And then the final thing is eventual cache consistency. So eventually, when we do writes in regions, the cache has to eventually get consistent in all the other ones. So we didn't talk about how this works, so that leads to our next thing, which is something called wormhole. So wormhole is a system that we've created, which is basically a pub sub system where people can subscribe to events from our database stream. So someone can say, hey, I want to see when uh, um, this association is being updated. Okay, that's fine. So then as soon as MySQL writes it out to the bin log, wormhole then tails this bin log and then can send that update out to the various consuming applications. So what sorts of things do we use wormhole for? So the first is cache invalidation. So this is used for distributing these cache invalidation worldwide. So we have multiple uh, remote regions. So like if one remote region does a write, we have to make sure that the data eventually gets invalidated in the other regions. We use it for things like indexing. So we rolled out something recently called graph search, where you can kind of do full text search in real time. And the way that works is there's a consumer that can consume this graph data. So basically it's able to uh, real time get changes that someone posted something. And again, it uses a separate system called Unicorn, which does all sorts of uh, full text searchy type things. We also have things like secondary index services. So when you want to index things like inside data types, so for example, if you want to not just get you know, someone's photos, but you want to get all photos that are above a certain resolution or something like that, uh, we have a secondary indexing service which can consume these as well. And the final thing is we actually use this to load data into our Hadoop data warehouses. So basically in real time, it can consume data, send it off to Hadoop so they can kind of get much more real time access of this data as well. So the final overall architecture, putting wormhole in the picture, is something like this. So we added wormhole here. So we now have writes occurring from some region. Again, get makes it to MySQL. MySQL replication occurs, writes it to the remote region. Wormhole tails that, says, hey, this data needs to change, needs to be invalidated, then broadcasts to the tau leader, which then can forward on to the tau follower. So in conclusion, Social graph data, our social graph data needs worldwide real-time access. We use distributed caching with this write-through solution in order to basically hide our latency issues. In order to create uh, uh, cache consistency uh, is a definite important thing that we have to always think about. In our case, tau MySQL wormhole is our solution. So thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, so you mentioned you do write through, and I'm just wondering, like, uh, you know, so you literally just update the cache, cache before you, you know, actually have the, your persistent store commit the change. And what happens, like, you write to your cache, but like you failed to write your persistent store? Okay, so the question, so basically, the way that works is we don't actually make it available in the cache until the write has returned successively from the database. So like, the follower has it, and the leader has it pending, basically. Uh, and then once the database says, hey, it's actually written, it returns it back to the leader, which says, okay, it's available, and then that returns it back and becomes available. So it doesn't actually become visible in the cache until those are returned. If it gets an error or whatever, it just throws that out and it's completely good. 
Yeah, it's kind of a two-step thing. It doesn't become available in the cache until it's guaranteed that it's been written. Hi. <clears throat> so how does the Tau system work together with the caching photo system? If I upload one picture where I tag also my friend, is uh, one transaction or the, the two things goes in uh, different ways? Because there is all the system related to the cache and the photos, which has uh, the hedge servers, the origin uh, layer, and also the another backend. How the transaction is done? Is it just one or? OK, so, the, so yes, um, it, it's a little complex. Because again, there are two different things. Right? You have the photo itself, which is stored in our media systems, Haystack and other things, and then cached in various places and so on. And then we have basically the information about that photo, like the fact that it exists, um, the, the, all that sorts of metadata about it, wh who's involved, and so on. And so th that'll involve creating a lot of different associations and objects and so on. And those will generally be on a single shard normally, and that would be transactional. Okay. If it spans multiple ones, then you know, we don't do cross-shard transactions. So we'd have to kind of have two separate uh, transactions and okay. so on for those. So but within a shard, things are normally transactional. So you just work with, with uh, the metadata of the photo you, you upload, it's just uh, one. Uh, what well, would be one thing, yeah. The fact that it was like uploaded by you and you know whatever okay. and so I on, see. yeah. Thank you. But there could be multiple involved. Hey, what what happens when like the van between the two regions is like lost and how do you, how does the wormhole knows like my binary log position is so and so and what happens when a master crashes during those situations? Okay, um, so essentially uh, all wormhole events are idempotent. So basically based on a temporal time we can actually replay extra. So wormhole guarantees at least once delivery but it could potentially deliver it multiple times. So like if we invalidate things twice, we don't care. So like if we, uh, the master crashes and we have to reparent, then basically we're able to resume based on a time basis and be like, okay, rewind 30 seconds uh, in the past and make sure that we've gotten everything in there. So we don't have to be exactly precise, which makes that uh, much easier than otherwise. Um, we may be eventually able to be much more precise with like GTIDs so we don't get the added work and stuff, but generally that's how we're able to do that. So what happens if uh, the master with the right fails, the whole region fails, after it actually asynchronously replicated to one region but not to the other? So, you get so if an entire region fails? Unavailable, fails, yes. Um, so if an entire region becomes unavailable, so essentially, so on a per node basis, we can, we can promote around uh, masters. So while I say master region, like we have a preferred one, but we can actually switch the master to anywhere. And the Tau leader which, that's involved with the rights will actually follow, and Tau will know to start forwarding to the correct region. So we can theoretically fail over an entire region. Um, we generally haven't done that because we have one of our own data centers and things generally work. Um, data centers don't but, fail? But it's, 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 it's possible that we can fail over every master to a new region. I mean, and then you can have like situation that this ride was replicated to one region, not to the other one, and then and, like, for a long time you'll have like inconsistent view of this data, right? Yeah, so, so in our actual promotion things, we basically have logic to figure out which regions are like most advanced and we can promote to wherever there. And we can even replay events from those to other ones as well. So we basically have the ability, we can resync in our failover, like when a master fails, we can actually resync everything to get them all to a consistent state immediately before we actually start accepting new writes. So, so you do that? Yes, we do that, yeah. We use actually, uh, there's a MySQL uh, HA, uh, MHA program that was written by Yoshinori on our team that actually can resync people from binary logs automatically. Like that. Um, when you do a, um, a sharding, do you use the social graph uh, for geo sharding? Do you use a social graph to help you optimize that sharding, or do you just brute force it and duplicate it? So uh, sharding, like on a user basis, so people are allocated to shards when they sign up, and then their data kind of goes on that shard. Um, and since people sign up at different times, like on the database level, we can't really control that. Um, people get assigned to a shard when they sign up in a, in a random fashion. Um, at other levels, things do can or possibly take advantage of things like that. Um, but our level, at the database level and stuff, it's, it's per shard. So, so what I was really um, thinking about was um, when you have friends who are wanting to view your data, and so you may tell from my accent I'm not from around here, um, you know, so someone's looking at my data in England, for example. I'm assuming you probably duplicate some of that data 
uh, in one of your European data centers. Yeah, so, so we don't partition the data at all. All of our data centers have the so full copies of data. Okay. Yeah. Because we don't know like where to can do and how to divide things up or whatever. So currently all of our data centers, or all of our regions, have full copies. Uh, could you could you share some of the numbers with us, uh, if you if you could like the size or the uh, many? Um, many. <laughs> uh, I can't share a lot of numbers. Uh, very large. Again, many many petabytes. Um, uh, we have multiple regions. We have uh, many requests. What do you say? So yeah, so so PQPS of uh, Tau is what a billion? It, it's two billion. So so we do two billion requests a second to Tau at peak. Um, MySQL, I had numbers. I think it does like forty-five million IOPS or something like that at peak. Um, so yeah, some rough numbers. I don't have them offhand, unfortunately. But yeah, big. So so two billion requests a second to Tau, and then MySQL ends up doing forty-five million IOPS. Into something like uh, 1.2 billion row reads or something. Any other questions? 